started in about two minutes here. If you're seated all the way in the back, I think we're going to have a smaller group this time. So if you want to come up closer, it would give us a, you know, more yeah, I don't know, combined feeling. <laughs> We have the both we have both mics here. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Talbert. I am a PhD student here at Hopkins. Been working with 21st Century Cities for about two and a half years, and this has been just like a wonderful symposium. This is your last workshop, workshop two of the day. You are in track two. Um, we have three great presenters. The main um, William Sandy Darity from Duke University here to talk about the national asset scorecard for communities of color, kind of the entire project and some policy implications for it. We also have Derek Hamilton. And then our discussant, I'm going to Caitlin, Carolyn Crockett from City of Boston. Um, well, from Boston, not City of Boston. And we're, yeah, we're looking forward to a really great discussion. The last workshop, we had a lot of good uh, questions, <coughs> answers afterwards. So please think of questions you want to ask. These guys are really conversational. So we're, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going. <laughs> well, at least we're voluble. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we want to talk about the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color. Uh, from a slightly different angle from the, uh, the route that Derek took in the previous session where Derek presented, uh, presented the results from our latest survey which has been conducted in Baltimore. Uh, I'm going to focus on the surveys that we conducted in five other cities. And uh, this is a, a project that was initially funded by the Ford Foundation, uh, largely funded by the Ford Foundation. Uh, you know, the, the, the two program officers who supported us uh, are no longer in the same positions, and so uh, we're, we're, we're struggling to see if there are possibilities of reproducing this, this survey in other cities. Uh, One but, of our current funders is in the room, Washington Center for Equitable Group. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, so, so uh, the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color has been in process for approximately four years now. So, um, so Derek and I are the principal investigators on this project. Uh, it's largely based at the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity, which I direct at Duke, but it's also obviously based at the New School, where, where Derek is located. And uh, we'd like to thank a variety of funders and partners who've been engaged in this, with this project. We'll try to list as many of them as, as we can here. Uh, but uh, I'd also like to note that uh, on a couple of the reports we generated out of this project, we had a collaboration with a couple of the branches of the, of the, of the Federal Reserve Board. So our study, The Color of Wealth in Los Angeles, was uh, produced in collaboration with the Federal Reserve Board Bank of San Francisco. And then uh, our report on Boston, the color, of wealth, uh, the color of Wealth in Boston, was produced in collaboration, in strong collaboration, with the Federal Reserve Bank, Bank of Boston. And uh, then we also have generated a report on Washington, D.C., called The Color of Wealth in the Nation's Capital. And Kilolo Kijikazi was the primary author on that, on that particular report. She's at the Urban Institute, so de facto we have a collaboration with the Urban Institute. So, uh, so, so it's, it's actually, it's been pretty exciting. And I'm, I, I don't want to neglect to mention Ann Price, who's president of the Insight Center for Community Economic Development, who has partnered with us fairly consistently on a wide range of projects, including the various color of wealth studies, but also uh, on, on, on papers, including my favorite of ours, called Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. So, uh, yeah. So here's, here's some images from the various reports that we've generated over the course of the NASP project. Uh, the very first one was uh, Beyond Broke, 
uh, which was done in collaboration with the Center for Global Policy Solutions uh, and Maya Rockamore, who is now running for governor of Maryland. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's now running for governor of Maryland, but she's the, was the director of the Center for Global Policy Solutions, so that's another collaborator. Uh, but you can see uh, umbrellas don't make it rain in the lower panel, and uh, bootstraps are for black kids, another panel, uh, the color of wealth in Boston, the color of wealth in the nation's capital, and the color of wealth in Los Angeles on the upper panels. Uh, and then, uh, Okay, I'll see, yeah, because you talked about that before. Uh, so we also generated a research brief uh, series, and the first, the, first, uh, the first number in that research brief series is called Women, Race, and Wealth, and there are actually some provocative findings here. Uh, so we were interested in the question of the intersection between uh, race and gender, and in particular, we wanted to look at uh, the wealth position of women who are unmarried, single women, and we wanted to make a comparison between black and white women. And one of our most striking findings, and it's a disturbing one, is the following. Let's see if my pointer will work. If you come down to this corner of the diagram, you'll see that for women who are single and 60 years of age or older, the median wealth for white women, whoops, the median wealth for white women is in excess of $380,000, and it's a mere $11,000 for black women. Now, for women who are in the youngest age category in our study, 20 to 29 years of age, you can see that the differential is much, much smaller, but it progressively widens as women age who are, uh, who are single. So I, I, we thought that this was a, a, a very striking finding about uh, the differences in the capacity of, of blacks and whites to actually pass on additional resources to the next generation because it's a very striking problem. Uh, Bootstraps are for Black Kids looks at the uh, provision of resources to support your children for a variety of activities. Uh, so home ownership, for the purposes of uh, gaining higher education, and um, one of the, the most uh, interesting findings here is that blacks with uh, black parents who provide some support for their kids' higher education have less wealth at the median than white parents who do not provide any support for their kids' higher education. So, did I hit the wrong thing again? Okay, here we go. You can see here that white parents who did not provide any educational help for their children had a median net worth of $73,878. In contrast, with black parents who did provide some educational help for their children, of 20, who had a median net worth of $24,887. So this is somewhat classic. You know, it's consistent with uh, a narrative that we think is fairly general, that, that black folks do more with less, okay? And, um, and then there was another interesting finding here that if you make a comparison between blacks and whites who received, uh, who, re who earned college degrees, or graduate degrees, uh, the proportion of, of white and black students uh, who have received uh, parental financial support is, is, is much the same. Or, I mean, the outcomes are much the same. So 
these are white and black students who receive some financial support for education from their parents. And if they did, uh, the completion rates of college degrees and graduate educational degrees are similar. Now, among those who did not receive educational help, there's a, there's a significant disparity. But among those who received some help, any help at all, uh, there's actually no disparity in outcomes. Okay. Uh, and so now this, this slide provides information about racial and ethnic wealth, wealth gaps and how they have grown since the Great Recession. And um, this actually carries you up to 2013, uh, where the most recent survey of consumer finances is for 2016. Uh, but essentially what the 2016 data shows is that um, whites have a net worth that is about 10 times greater than that of blacks at the median in the 2016 data. Uh, in the 2013 data, the gap was wider, so 13 times larger. Uh, but, um, uh, but we have not returned to the levels that existed prior to the Great Recession. And here's a comparison of median household net worth in 2013 dollars looking at all black and white households from the Pew Research Center. And if you look at 2013 again, you can see that the relationship is quite staggering. Once again, uh, this is roughly consistent with uh, each white household having, uh, having, having uh, 13 cents for each cent that black folks have at the median. So, uh, whoop, I'm sorry? I bogged you down when you've done the slides. So okay, just so skip them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so here's, here's how we get into the NAS survey. So, there are two dimensions of what we have talked about with respect to racial wealth differences that are not handled by the national data sets satisfactorily. The first is asset markets are local. And, and particularly if you think about prices for homes, they're, they're very local in the sense that uh, the price differentials for similar structures of houses are quite, quite sharp across the country. And, uh, and it is possible to physically move homes, uh, but that doesn't happen very often. And I guess if you moved it to the new location, its price value would become different also. So. Uh, so, so that's, that's the first issue. Asset markets are local. So by looking at specific metropolitan areas, it's possible to control for the specificity of the price values for assets in those areas. The second problem is the wealth position of many communities of color remains unknown or hidden in the national data sets. So for example, you might be able to extract a category in the aggregate like Asian from uh, from, from, uh, from a national data set, but you will not be able to get the specificity that will allow you to look at, say, Cambodians or Filipinos or Vietnamese separately uh, or individually. And so one of the neat things about the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color is that we were able to identify a set of cities that would allow us to look at narrowly defined national origin groups. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's probably for me, anyway, that's the most interesting aspect of our, of our, of our project. Uh, I'm going to go past these. And this may be a little bit hard to read, but it gives you a sense of what the distribution is of the number of observations for each group. And it also gives you a sense of the amount of detail that we were able to obtain. So the, the, the five metropolitan areas in the original phase of the NAS study were Los Angeles, Miami, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Washington, DC, and Boston, Massachusetts. Those are the five. They were chosen specifically because there were particular national origin groups that we would be able to try to isolate as a consequence of the selection of those cities. And, um, and we chose Tulsa, Oklahoma in particular because that's the one that most people view as somewhat of an outlier because it would provide us with the ability to look at uh, a Native American community in greater depth than, 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 other, than the other cities 
want us to do. So you can see that uh, we're able to sort between uh, between blacks in a way that we dehomogenize the black population. We can look separately at blacks who are of Caribbean origin, blacks who are of recent immigration from uh, the African continent, and then we actually have a small number of Cape Verdeans that we could identify from Boston. Uh, but now if we look at the so-called Latino group, we can find that we actually have uh, the capacity to look separately at Mexicans, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, uh, some Central Americans, etc. And among uh, the Asian population, we can look separately at Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Vietnamese, and Asian Indians. And I, I believe our study is the very first to have any significant or robust numbers of Asian Indian respondents of any study that has actually been conducted. And then with respect to the Tulsa, Oklahoma data, because you can see that that's the exclusive site in which we have data about Native Americans, we can actually distinguish between those who have tribal and rural status and those who do not. Uh, and, and that's actually going to be interesting to examine uh, in terms of, of wealth difference, differentials. So here's some demographic characteristics in Tulsa as an illustration. Uh, we, can, we can identify whether or not individuals were born in the United States. Uh, whether they live in a more rural area versus a more urban area, uh, whether their parents were married, uh, what the level of college education was, uh, for or whether or not there was a college, college educated head of household, and whether or not anybody in the family had exposure to incarceration. And you, you can see uh, that for, uh, well, nobody does all that well in Tulsa, okay? Whether white or black or Native American. But, but you can see, though, that conditions are, are definitely worse uh, for, uh, for, for blacks and for Mexicans and for Native Americans than they are for whites. But the, the, the status or conditions for whites is not spectacularly high in, in Tulsa. And, I, I, and we'll, we'll see some other illustrations of that. All right, here's a table that's slightly different. This is on asset ownership in Los Angeles. And uh, we can look here at differences between uh, whether or not individuals rely upon payday lending. And you can see there's a very high dependence upon payday lending in the black community there whether individuals are banked or unbanked, uh, whether they have retirement resources, whether they own their homes, and whether or not they're business owners. And one of the most striking findings here is that the home ownership rate for US black descendants and for African blacks is actually higher than it is for Asian Indians. Okay. So keep that in mind, because I want you to look at what the net worth data is. For, uh, for those groups when we come to the Los Angeles slide. But it's, it, you know, for folks who are always saying that home ownership is the driver of wealth, this is a particular statistic that gives us pause on that point. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that. This is a somewhat interesting slide, I think. Um, this is a slide that looks at payday lending use in the last five years across the various groups in the various cities. And one of the things that's, that's demonstrably true is that the payday lending rates usage is extremely high for all groups in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's, it's relatively low for all groups in Boston. And so one of the things that Derek discovered was that actually uh, this may be linked to differences in state regulations on predatory lending. And so uh, Massachusetts appears to have the most stringent regulations. Uh, Oklahoma has relatively lax regulations. And so as a consequence, the variation that we observe across the cities 
may well be linked to the, uh, the structures of laws that manage it. Uh, the District of Columbia has relatively, uh, relatively strong restrictions on, on various forms of predatory lending. So that's somewhat interesting. And here's a table with the home ownership variations across the cities. And again, I, I want to highlight once again the fact that uh, both uh, U.S. black descendants and African blacks have higher rates of home ownership than Asian Indians in, in Los Angeles. So here's values of income. And one of the striking things about uh, analyses of net worth or wealth is how much wider the gaps are for wealth than they are for income, even though they are substantial for income. Uh, but here you can have a you get a flavor of the the disparities in income or the flows of income uh, that that that, um, that that are taking place across these various cities. One of the uh, one of the striking findings here is if you look at the comparison between the income level for African blacks in Los Angeles and African blacks in the District of Columbia, they're quite quite different. And in fact, uh, the income level for Af African blacks in the District of Columbia is lower than the median income level for, for blacks who are US black descendants. Uh, it's quite the opposite in LA. Uh, similarly, if you were to look at, uh, is it the Korean population? The Korean population in Los Angeles has a lower level of income at the median than the Korean population in, in Washington, D.C. And when we look at wealth, these kinds of differentials are going to be even more dramatic. The key point is that all ethnic and racial groups do not have the same economic condition in all cities. Uh, and uh, uh, racial similarity does not necessarily lead to economic similarities once you take into account ethnic differentiation. Uh, and so we need to be cognizant both of location and the particular ethnic group. And the other point that we want to make here is that there is a tremendous degree of variation in the income levels within this group that's collectively referred to as Asian. Okay. So we're, we're losing a lot of information when we talk about Asians in the aggregate. OK, so now here's the wealth table. Uh, and so. You know, we always disturb people with this statistic, that the median value of household wealth for US black descendants in Boston is $8. That's, that's not 80, that's not 800, that's $8. Okay. Uh, but the Baltimore data is actually closer to zero, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. So, uh, but you can see that across all the cities, Black levels of wealth are extremely low. In the two cities in which we have representation from Mexican respondents, wealth levels are extremely low. Now, the, one of the points that, that, uh, that we were making earlier was that the home ownership rates, both for US black descendants and African blacks, was higher than the home ownership rate for Asian Indians in Los Angeles. You can see that the net worth for African blacks in Los Angeles is considerably higher than it is for US black descendants, but both groups are strikingly lower than the net worth position of Asian Indians who have a 40% home ownership rate. Okay. So uh, somehow they're getting high levels of wealth without <coughs> having uh, extraordinary levels of home ownership. Okay, so uh, that's, that's worth, worth investigating. The other thing that's striking is that the wealth differential between African blacks in Washington, D.C. versus African blacks in Los Angeles. And similarly, uh, the huge difference in wealth between Koreans in Los Angeles and Koreans in Washington, D.C. So. Finally, if we want to look at the Native American population in Tulsa, we find that actually the individuals who are tribally enrolled actually have higher levels of wealth than the individuals who report no tribal enrollment but an American Indian identity. And so uh, we were trying to figure out what was going on there. And we think 
that the tribal enrollment, particularly for the Cherokee respondents, is also associated with access to certain casino rights, which, uh, which, which may have contributed to their higher or, or more sub substantially higher wealth position. Uh, we can see that uh, for whites in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they're actually reporting, along with whites in Miami, Florida, the lowest levels of net worth among whites. Now, here's a table on various kinds of transfers. So let me see if I can get this right. Remittances are transfers that individuals send abroad. Transfer, U.S. transfers means transfers that they make to other people who are in the United States. Gifts received are in vivo transfers and then we have correspondingly the wealth levels for each of these groups. So as you might anticipate, the communities that have a high immigrant presence also have a high remittance level. Okay. And you can see, for example, that Mexican immigrants are 46% are, uh, of the respondents who are Mexican immigrants are making some form of remittance. 42% uh, of Filipino respondents were making some form of remittance. 40% uh, of Asian, uh, Asian Indians. But for the groups that are, are non-immigrant communities, they still are, uh, they, they have comparable rates, roughly, of, of uh, making transfers internally in the United States. Interestingly enough, US blacks have the highest reported rate. Whether or not you received a gift, well, you can see that 33% uh, of Japanese Americans received a gift, 30% of Chinese Americans, 32% of Mexican uh, Americans received a gift. And then uh, you can see the corresponding wealth relationship uh, that you can compare against that. So when we look at these categories of activities, whites are not normative in the sense of having uh, having the highest rates in all cases, with the exception of U.S. trend. Uh, that's specifically Miami, Florida, Boston, Tulsa. OK, so let me come to uh, the big lessons that we learned across the five cities. First, there's a high degree of variation within these broadly defined ethnic groups. That, that is to say, talking about uh, Latinos talking about Asians, talking about blacks, talking about whites for that matter, because we, we haven't talked at all about uh, ethnic variation among whites. But talking about all these groups in terms of some sort of singular homogeneous category is actually causing a lot of information to disappear about variations within those groups that are based upon national origin. Also, there's variation that's associated with immigration status. There's also variation in receipts and remission across ethnic groups that's based on immigrant status. Uh, again, as I noted earlier, income inequality pales in comparison to wealth inequality. An ethnic group's relative asset position may vary sharply across cities. Home ownership varies across cities and may not be the only important driver of wealth. And then there's substantial asset variation across and within cities in the United States. But in our sample of our five cities, blacks and Mexicans are persistently at the bottom of the ranks. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have Carolyn um, ask you to respond to what you've heard, um, you know, and we can have a conversation between the, the two researchers and you and then open it up for questions. Um, so first, I really want to give uh, thanks to Sandy and Derek uh, for just an incredible body of work uh, that is so uh, right on time, so necessary, and so evocative in terms of how we think about not only cutting edge research with an equity lens, but what that means in the policy realm. So I, I, I took a lot of notes listening, and I also sat in the previous session, which was really helpful to think about what the, the, the research for, for Baltimore is emerging as. So um, 
Uh, for me, as someone who, who sits in, in the mayor's office and works on uh, economic policy for the city of Boston, um, I couldn't think of, a, we, we spent so much time with the Color of Wealth report and we're really indebted again to the framework of the scholarship here, but also to the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston that has done a really great job of making sure that there's circulation and conversation for this work, which doesn't always happen, right? So you do an incredible study and it sits on a shelf or you go to Baltimore to hear about your own city, but there is no discussion in Boston. I'm here to tell you that was not the case, that we had lots of conversation about this work. And I really want to make three sort of brief comments and reactions here and maybe open up the floor to a larger Q&A. So um, some of the value of the National Asset Scorecard for us in Boston, uh, and for me in particular since I sit in the policy space, is thinking about the quality and specificity of the data. So as, as Sandy discussed, so often when we talk about populations of color, these groups are, are, are bundled in a way that make it really difficult to kind of get inside of the nuances of subcategories. So in Boston in particular, our uh, metropolitan statistical area that was recognized, that was um, used in this study represents about 4.6 million people. Um, and that, that, that populace together is about 74% white. But when you come down to gateway cities and even cities like Boston, where you have have a, a non-white majority, it becomes really difficult to understand what is going on. So in Boston, we have incredible divides in terms of um, the way the city is racially segregated, but also income. We have the um, unpleasant distinction of being recognized as the Brookings Institutes of having uh, institution for having the number one highest income inequality in the country. So um, our conversation had been very much around what do we do about that, and then what do you think about when and you're having a conversation about income versus wealth. And so again, part of the value of the study is making sure that when we're having, we're having larger discussions, it's not just about trying to increase somebody's wages on a job, but how do you think about intergenerational wealth transfer? How do you think about asset cultivation from a structural position? Uh, which is the second point for me, which is the importance of thinking about uh, an analysis of the structural causes of wealth disparity. So how do we broaden up the conversation so we're talking about what people actually own or what their savings look like or what does that transfer again look like from one generation to the next. And then the call for structural, resp uh, structural response is critical. And unfortunately in the policy domain, even in progressive, so-called progressive places like Boston, that very uh, durable conversation around uh, the moral, immoral uh, behavior of people who are in poverty or these conversations that have to do with in individual deficits, those kind of outmoded and outdated and debunked discussions still persist in policy spaces. So to have a structural analysis uh, here is, is, is essential. And so um, very interesting for us, particularly in Boston, we are was chatting earlier with someone talking about our, our particular political uh, context, which is a, a city that has a new mayor. So we have uh, Mayor Martin J. Walsh, who has just been reelected, which is great. I came in with the new administration three years ago, and it is the first new mayor that we've had in the city of Boston in 20 years. And for any of you that know anything about the history of Boston and the, uh, the, the intensity of politics there, which is truly a blood sport, it's interesting because I come from a very long tradition of Irish Catholic mayors. And so the previous mayor was the first uh, non-Irish mayor that the city had since the Depression. And so we have this continuous line of, of Irish political dominance, which has really made it interesting in this particular moment of, of sitting again inside of a city that has a, a non-white majority of thinking about what does it mean to bring a much more plural, uh, diverse, and uh, frankly, uh, disruptive conversation to discussions around not only diversity but also economic equity. And so um, I have had a little bit of whiplash these last couple of days because there's so many black mayors that are at this particular convening. <laughs> have you seen me taking pictures? It's because I feel like I'm in some kind of futuristic uh, <laughs> location. But it's interesting to think about, again, what does it mean for cities that, like Boston, again, are not only increasingly socially diverse, but we're also uh, in a boom time. So Boston right now is in an incredible economic boom, 
it could be, well, when this is over, we could be looking at what would have been the third greatest economic boom in the city's 400 year history. So an incredible uh, inrush of folks who are trying to locate to the city as individuals, but also corporate relocation. So lots of pressure on the city in terms of how it's growing and developing, and the need for new tools to address that are essential. So uh, for a couple things for us have been, again, beyond just a discussion around equity has been what does it mean to really drive drive that down beyond just a conversation around equity in terms of income, but what does it mean for uh, a, a financial empowerment agenda? So a couple years ago, the mayor set up the Office of Financial Empowerment as a way to think about uh, financial, not just financial education, but credit counseling, financial checkups for individuals, for residents, for folks who are job seekers. Also set up two years ago, uh, children's savings accounts as a way to create wealth opportunities for families with children in pre-kindergarten. So what, through the children's savings accounts, um, really trying to think about what does it mean for a municipality to take that step to seed uh, different kinds of behavior around asset cultivation, asset growth, and how do you link that with educational outcomes for children and for families to think about the life cycle of a child over time for, for college, for post-secondary education, for job training. So these are just some of the ways that we've tried to really broaden our own toolkit and understanding for how uh, the power of the mayor's office and also municipal authority tries to think about policy as a way to think to change behavior. So not just again on the wage side of this, not just a limited conversation about small business development, which I'm sensitive to because I direct the city small business office, and so did appreciate your critiques earlier around uh, a lot of uh, almost a fetish fetishization around um, entrepreneurship, around business activity, and that's something that I, I know that we hold as a caution in the city of Boston and really want to open up the discussion because there's got to be much more robust conversations around how do you think about an equity agenda. Um, one last thing and then I'll I'll sit down to open it up. For us has been a, a, a growing consideration in the business space about cooperative ownership and how that also can be a wealth uh, creator for, uh, for worker coalitions, for working class populations. Uh, we have a large uh, a Latino population in East Boston, which is really pushing us to think more about cooperative models of, of business. And so that's been something that we've added to our lending capability from the city's perspective beyond sole proprietorships so and thinking about, again, co-ops. And now trying to push that into uh, a larger consideration about equity-based work and, and how that can look beyond um, just very, I would say, fundamentalist, capitalist versions of, of kind of business development. So um, for us in, a, in the city, really learning from what are our multiracial, multi-ethnic populations, very strong Cape Verdean population for sure, the second largest Cape Verdean population in the country, uh, the third largest Haitian population in the country behind uh, New York and Miami, very, very robust uh, discussions around what have, have we learned, not just from those populations based on their experience in the US, but what have they brought with uh, them in terms of learning from other national contexts. So again, thank you so much for this work and scholarship and look forward to the conversation. So I, uh, responses, I'll, I'll say, first, thank you. Those, those comments were generous, insightful, and motivating. Um, uh, and I'm glad you referenced the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Sandy and I have the privilege of presenting the work, but there were many partners and individuals that really pushed forward this work even beyond research into implementation. And Anna Patricia Munoz at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, who's no longer there, she, you know, if there was a third PI, she and a couple of other people, they would be the third PIs, absolutely, as, as partners. Um, you pointed out the Brookings study, pointing out the income inequality in Boston. Uh, of the cities we've analyzed, Boston is also the city with the most wealth inequality that we are, are observing. And obviously, we don't have wealth data in all cities in America, but it seems that that income translates into wealth inequality as well. Uh, although the racial compositions are different between Baltimore and Boston, there seems to be some lessons, that some parallels. For example, a, a pretty sizable working class white population. And one aspect of the study that Sandy and I intend to do that we haven't done yet is disaggregate that white population as well. We disaggregate blacks, Latinos, and Asians. Well, let's look at some of the 
differences, if they are, between whites claiming Irish heritage versus Italian heritage versus another heritage. Um, and that might be really relevant in places like Boston and Baltimore as well. So we want to do that. Um, what else? Last thing I will mention is that uh, a big point and desire we have with doing this work is to make it actionable. I think we are scholar activists, and we wear that with a badge of honor. Oftentimes in a scholarly community, uh, being public intellectuals or being individuals interested in political economy has become an arbitrage. And some, if somehow we are less objective, we take a different stance. We, we understand all our, all our work leads with values. We recognize those values, but in, in our pursuit of knowledge and truth, we, we ask rigorous questions and, and, and uh, uh, go through rigorous research processes, but ultimately the goal is to improve people's lives. So we like the partnerships and we, we are happy that our work is, is, is actionable. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions from you. We had a lot last session and I hope that we can get some more people involved this time with a slightly smaller group. So any, any questions, any other discussion points you want to raise? Yeah, the people have questions, but I, I just want to show one thing also, that, that one of the points in our work, and, but ask questions too, don't let this. Uh, one thing that surprised us when we, when we initially did these results, we didn't disaggregate the Mexican population into those that were foreign born versus domestic born. But you know, we found this surprising result, at least from our point of view, uh, but maybe if we think a little more, it's not that surprising. The Mexican population is overwhelmingly immigrant uh, in, in, uh, in the United States, but when we disaggregate, the domestic born Mexicans do have a uh, higher net wealth than those that were foreign born. So immigration matters also in terms, of, in addition to ancestral origin, whether you're foreign born or not might matter also. Wonderful. Headed back. Sure. Um, my name is Nina Johnson. I'm a professor at Swarthmore College uh, in Philadelphia, and I'm a sociologist. So my question is going to be slanted toward my discipline, of course. But um, in thinking about assets, I want to go back to Dr. Darity's earlier point when you said that black folks seem to do more with less, um, which is unsurprising. But I guess when I'm thinking about assets, your work shows us that black families, particularly US descended black families in some cases, um, have less wealth. Um, and so I wanted to know in sort of future research that you do with this, this data, is there a way to get at how black families do more with less? Is there a way to get at assets in sort of a broader framework beyond sort of wealth and income to really look at how people navigate systems, you know, certain knowledge bases, et cetera? And again, that's a sociological question, but I'm just wondering how you guys are thinking about that and if there's a way to identify how people do more with less. So, so we, we, we don't, well, just a little caution. Um, Sandy clearly pointed out that black families are doing more with less. We're not necessarily ones that are proponents of, of that type of rhetoric, and I don't think you are either, no, because no. The, the question we ask is at what cost? And, the, and you know, would, would whites do it if they were in a similar position? We have no reason to believe they wouldn't. They probably would. But as, as you, we have a structure where one of the points we're trying to make, and I think you're making this point too, is that Despite the rhetoric that blacks don't value education, well, that doesn't seem to, to co coexist with the, with the data that we, we present, that we find that despite having meager circumstances, they're still paying for children to go to school. And when they do, the outcome is that so-called large achievement gap seems to go away. But another question that our research is leading us to ask is, at what cost? Will that overexertion doing more, will it manifest in some of the health inequities that we see? We observed that at higher levels of education, the black-white disparities in health remain persistent and then sometimes increase. So why is it that a college-educated black woman is more likely to have an infant death than a white woman who dropped out of high school? Well, um, we haven't developed the causal link yet, 
but at least from a theoretical perspective, we believe that some of this stress and even that rhetoric of working hard and uh, trying to make it on with, with limited resources very well might manifest in some of these outcomes that we observe, like health. But actually, to speak to that point, some of the research is showing that it's, sorry. To speak to that point, actually, the research is showing something different, where it's that uh, medical entities are showing racial bias and not treating black women as well as they would white families, too. But, but that's true for whether a black woman has a college degree or not. So across, but the two, that doesn't exclude the other explanation. The point that we're trying to demonstrate or examine is, well, we know there's health disparity between blacks and whites. But we, what we also know from the health literature is that if you get an education, if you get a good job, that that's supposed to be a protective factor. And within group, that is true. High educated blacks have better health outcomes than low educated blacks. But the paradox is that why is it that education doesn't protect blacks in the same way as it protects whites? So discrimination can be a factor, both at the delivery level, but also from the structural level of having to deal with microaggression, stress, et cetera. I just want to reinforce that. Um, I'm Lindsay Townsend from Johns Hopkins. Um, the idea of microaggressions and, and sort of chronic stressors in Michael Marmot's original research on health disparities, he was expecting to find executive stress worse than lower level stress. And he actually found that low level employees who don't have control over their environment and don't have control over their choices or limited control actually had higher levels of stress and and it's possible you might hypothesize that the higher up you go in the competitive careers the more stress you have if you're encountering bias so you know that, that's also related to the John Henry work that Sherman James has been doing where uh, you know Sherman James tried to explain differences in uh, blood pressure and uh, uh, heart disease at, uh, across race and what what he came up with was this John Henry scale where he, he argued that those blacks that face structural barriers you, you know, that face structural barriers like uh, in, in positions where they don't have access to good jobs etc but have a high sense of efficacy or uh, a, a desire to overcome their obstacles that it manifests relative to other blacks that don't indicate so much on the John, so high on the John Henry scale and higher blood pressure than their comparisons. The one aspect that we want to expand on John Henry is he did, he did not find that blacks with high levels of education and in high occupations, he didn't examine that relative to other whites. He looked at intra-race differences, not inter-race differences, as as in, as a as you move up in socioeconomic status, so the next phase of, of some of our work is to look at what happens when you move up in socioeconomic status for those blacks that might face even greater com, com, greater pressure and discrimination because now they are a threat to the established social hierarchy because that black person with a college degree now is more threatening than the black person who doesn't have a college degree. Well, plus they have higher self expectations. I think the the phrase that uh, yeah. I think the phrase that that Sherman used was high effort coping. Yeah, and uh, and and we can think about this uh, both intra racially and inter racially on three different dimensions. So one is uh, the dimension of individuals who are experiencing upward mobility. Another is individuals who are experiencing lateral mobility. And then the third group is the individuals that we, we don't usually talk about this category, but downward mobility. And downward mobility, particularly with respect to income, is more pronounced for blacks than it is for whites. And uh, one could imagine that that might also be another source of stress, not only in terms of the personal expectations that the individual has, but in terms of their their families' perceptions of them, you know, you know, they're 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 kicking a legacy out or something. 
So, no. So, I wanted to ask a question, but it had to do with the earlier panel. So, for those who weren't here, I apologize. So, part of the earlier panel, uh, there was a slide that showed that um, middle class blacks are more likely to have a family member that's lower income than a similarly positioned white person. What impact does it have on both education, um, incarceration, and wealth in general? So, I, you know, I, I guess uh, maybe 20 years ago in, in Gina Chitaji and I did this work looking at the impact of having a kin member in poverty on the racial wealth gap. And this was done in the context of welfare reform, context of William Julius Wilson's The Declining Significance of Race, where some of the arguments were that if you were black and made it out of poverty, then that was your escape hatch into the American dream. And race mattered to the extent that it was conflated with poverty. So we selfishly were in doing a postdoc and we had relatives asking us for money and our peers had relatives had, were getting access to trust funds. So, so this motivated us to do this research to see if poverty in their family was an additional inhibitor of blacks to acquire similar wealth as their white peers who were middle class. And indeed, we found that not only did blacks have larger networks of poverty, but that they also had, that that was associated with, a, with an explanatory factor of the racial wealth gap in the amount of about 10% of poverty in the family, which is a non-trivial amount of being able to explain the racial wealth gap. Uh, but, but, you know, it speaks to a larger issue of, we talk about individuals being, a, and America has a lot of rhetoric on individual effort and individuals overcoming their obstacles, but we need to learn from sociologists in the room about the roles of structure, and when we think about family, how family itself influences outcome. So even in the context of welfare reform, if we observe successes, at what cost are black family members now having to pick up some of the, the responsibility that previously the federal government might, might have borne? I, I just wanted to make another comment about the, um, the disproportionate amount of support that black black households give to their children for higher education. Uh, so even though the median level of wealth for black households that provide some support is considerably lower than the median level of wealth of white households that don't provide any support, if we think about it, the figure on our, on our estimate is about $24,000 for the black household. And the typical black household has a median wealth of about seven thousand dollars. So, the the household with twenty four thousand dollars may have some sense that they've got a greater capacity to provide if they're comparing themselves with other black households. Yeah. Um, so right here, uh, you you don't have the slide up anymore. But I was just struck by you know as you were doing these um, comparisons across across different different cities and for particular groups there were just some drastic differences within the same group across different cities. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about what, what you found in terms of geography and, and, and in terms of how those intersected with the particular subgroups that you looked at. I mean, that's the motivation for us doing this, right? So the problem with the federal data infrastructure is you can't do something like this. You can't identify structural patterns as it relates to racial and ethnic inequality because they simply don't drill down on local levels in metropolitan areas to get that data. But what we uncover is that this very well may be linked to policies. Some cities might be better in do, dealing with certain aspects of policy, certain aspects of socioeconomic inequality than others. With wealth, you know, we get variation, but the overall picture is the wealth gap is enormous. But on certain dimensions like payday lending, we can see just, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, at least from draw, drawing, like we don't have a causal frame, but we can see that there are differences and there is at least a relationship between policy across these cities. And the last point that we can make is addressing this notion of model minority mythology. This, this thing that there's some, some cultural ethic associated with being Korean, for instance, which is racist towards them as well, um, and racist in general towards other groups. Well, 
Why is it that a Korean in LA, their relative position is so much lower than a Korean in DC? It does, right, are they culturally different? Um, or is it something to do about some, some selection pattern that, that, that got a Korean to, LA, to DC as opposed to LA? Well, we don't know the answer yet, but it definitely at least rules out the explanation that there's some sort of innate cultural trait that's associated with Korean ancestry. And I would say in the case of the Vietnamese, you get a similar kind of result where the Vietnamese in, in, in Washington, D.C. have uh, a, a much, much higher net worth than the Vietnamese in, in Los Angeles. I would also argue that, as Derek was suggesting, that it's associated with different immigrant streams going to different cities. And so the, the Vietnamese population that migrated to Washington, D.C. tends to be largely drawn from a more professional strata class, whereas that's not the case for the Vietnamese who migrated to Los Angeles, or for that matter, migrated to some of the southern states of the United States. Uh, so it, it becomes also critical to think about not only uh, which national origin groups typically brought certain resources to the United States, but who among those national origin groups brought certain resources to the United States. So the story becomes much more complicated when we, we pay attention to these kinds of things. And, and naming it a scorecard becomes useful also because as I'll discuss and pointed out, Carolyn, that cities don't want to be a, a city that, that looks very unequal, right? So the scorecard provides some level of accountability as well. So you can look at how you rank compared to another city in, in addressing this, this inequity. And some of the difference may have to do to be really like not very fine-grained about it is what's the most valuable talent in Hollywood? You know, look pretty in a conventional way. And that's what gets paid grade. What's the most valuable talent in Washington, D.C., besides from being corrupt, is, is a, you know, smart policy oriented. That's what a big section of the business. So it, there's some of, you know, what the business, what the economic drivers are of a city that has a lot to do with what people are paid. I mean, well, I'm going to say it's start off. Well, yeah. well, well, that concern is, that's, that's important too, but of course, where the pools of wealth, how are they derived in Hollywood versus, or Los Angeles versus Washington? You say yeah. there might be different wealth pools. So I'm going to say something tongue in cheek first. Koreans in LA are not, I, I don't perceive them to be more or less attractive than Koreans in DC or Koreans relative to a Vietnamese or, or Japanese in LA. But, so that's just meant to be tongue in cheek. But, but, but the, the, the point, that I, the, the real point is that, yeah, local context matters. But why should it privilege, why, why, and, and that might be the point, but local context privileging an ethnic group more in one local context as opposed to another, right? We, we need to question why. But whatever the reason, it does not seem to be something associated with some cultural ethic associated with that ethnic group. Why would we expect the Koreans in LA to be culturally distinct from the Koreans in DC? So hi, Rajani Frederick with the Center for American Progress. I have two quick points and then a question. Yeah, in DC, I remember vaguely that wasn't DC the city of the ugly people compared to Los Angeles? <laughs> Yeah, that brought back memories. Um, I've never thought that. It was some, I'll find it and send it to you, Sandy. Um, but uh, the first quick point, I just wanted to thank Carolyn for um, sharing the experience in Boston. I had the privilege of working with uh, Boston's health um, department on place matter issues with Nishira Burrill back in the day. So I know that you guys are doing a lot of amazing work around equity and really incorporating an equity lens. So that said, I really hope that you connect with the Detroit people or folks. Um, I was, I had the opportunity to stay and listen in on their presentation at the last track. And it seems as if they are really struggling or at the cusp of trying to address um, 
you know, Detroit's um, coming back from bankruptcy and the hyper focus on kind of revitalization and economic development. They're being really intentional about ensuring that they um, incorporate and design evaluation up front. So I'm hoping that you can share your experiences and encourage them to incorporate an equity lens um, such that they're able to weigh every kind of policy or public action, assessing who benefits and who burdens from each decision that they make. I think that's going to be helpful to ensure that they don't follow the same missteps of other cities in terms of extreme inequality. Um, the second point, um, I really wanted to go back to the stress conversation that we had just a while ago, definitely lifting up what Derek uh, mentioned in terms of its and both discrimination that we see in the medical field, um, but also uh, the stress of microaggressions. And I'm lifting up Arlene Geronimus's work specifically at the University of Michigan. Um, her work that she's done since the 1970s on the weathering effect is really powerful stuff that I encourage folks to read up on if they're interested. And then finally, my question as a non-economist, I'm just really curious about the gifts received category. And I'm just curious, what was all categorized under gift received? And were there any striking differences that deviated from your original hypothesis when, once you saw the data? Specifically, it, were you expecting to see any differences between the US born versus foreign born? Right, so a couple of little nuance. We, we learn iteratively from doing this work. And when we initially collected the first five cities, the gift and inheritance was not carried out the way we had fully intended, but there's still value in the data. The, the new, and I only say that because the, Boston, the, the Baltimore data might be slightly different in the way it was collected on, that, on the inheritance and gifts in particular. But uh, specifically to answer your question, gifts are, did you receive a gift from a family, a, a parent or a relative in excess of $10,000? That's just what it is. And that could have been foreign or domestic. The things that are, are separated is, did you make remittances, which is explicitly to a different uh, entity outside of the US, or did you make a domestic transfer to, to another relative or friend? The, the Baltimore data, the gifts excludes any resources that were given towards school or home ownership in which we asked them separately, did you receive resources specifically for, for education purposes? And we, we wanted to disaggregate that, that information because we're going to try to examine them specifically on certain outcomes in more detailed manner. And that's just learning by doing from previous iteration of the data. The important point about that difference is that in the first five cities, there is subjectivity to what people interpreted as constituting a gift that is somewhat, uh, somewhat removed in the Baltimore study because we asked about some specific categories of potential gifts. So somebody might not think that their parents providing them with higher education support is a gift because that's just what your parents are supposed to do, right? So, uh, so it it may for some groups actually be underestimating the num the uh, the proportion of individuals who actually did receive a gift. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll take we'll take one more question and then um, wrap up. Hi. Uh, so now that you've done uh, five, now six of these, I'm curious about two things. One, uh, are, is it getting more, are you figuring out how to make it more efficient over t uh, each time around? Um, curious about that. And two, um, what, what's the uptake now for the Federal Reserve or, you know, which policymakers is it the Census Bureau? Who is it that you feel like has been most responsible? I mean, you're working with the Federal Reserve in some instances, different branches, right? Is it, is it, do you feel like they're most likely to take this up? Um, and, and do they care about it being efficient? Or they, do they just have, I mean, they have an endless bag of money, so they can just do this, right? Hey, and to add to that, I, I would kind of like to hear how, how Boston decided to interact with this particular research. I know you spoke a little bit to that, but how you would encourage you know other cities to start getting involved in that as well. So we can wrap up with you answering that. Yes. 
So you always ask us the tough questions. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, we think uh, if this were to be something that would be executed at the federal level, uh, that the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances is the best route to do it with the proviso that what they do it every three years, right? It's every three years. So uh, with the proviso that they would take a single metropolitan area and study it in depth in, in a particular year. So they could rotate across the cities over time uh, unless they were also willing to do more than one city in a given, in a given year. But that, that's probably the entity that's most likely to do it. It's probably a bit more likely when Janet Yellen was still the uh, Fed chair. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure the new Fed chair is really awful. I just don't know yet, right? So, so we'll see. Uh, but I, I really think there's much more of a likelihood that this would happen through the Federal Reserve Board than it would through, say, the Census Bureau. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Was there another part to the question? Uh, is it, uh, are you learning anything about how to make it more efficient over time and get it easier? Or maybe that doesn't happen. So it's, it's, uh, the, the efficiency factor only is associated with the fact that we have a well-developed survey instrument, which we can modify slightly from city to city but we don't have to prepare a new, an altogether new survey instrument. So, so that's making things more efficient. But these have all been conducted, the ones that we've described here have all been conducted primarily as phone interviews. It's very expensive to do because the, uh, <clears throat> the rates of completed surveys are extremely low. So you probably get about 0.2 completed surveys per hour. And so they're very time consuming and very expensive. We've also done a set of face-to-face -face interviews in Los Angeles. Uh, so we've got two data sets for Los Angeles. The face-to-face -face interviews probably cost about three times as much as the phone interviews. We haven't figured out how we might do this with a nationally representative sample online, but uh, the online survey would be the most efficient way to do this. Uh, people keep touting big data, but you couldn't get this combination of information from any set of big data sources. You really do need to conduct the surveys. And so, uh, you know, if we could figure out a way to do this effectively online, that would make it, uh, make it far more efficient. I mean, like here, here's the, we, we have, to answer your question, yes, we've been in contact. There's been, you know, mixed reception. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes they ignore us. But uh, I, I, we, we ultimately, that is the goal, right? That is the goal to get this data. If we don't collect information, we can't address problems, and we're not collecting this information. So if we have this information, it becomes a powerful tool for everybody. Here's a template that we've been generally presenting on how to implement it, and Sandy pretty much described it. Uh, we, we've been mostly dealing with the Federal Reserve Bank of Federal Reserve, but we have a convening coming up with the U.S. Census as well. And the U.S. Census typically does not collect asset and debt information. Right. I don't know why they don't. Um, but, but if they did, then that would also provide a, a mechanism by which we could collect this information. So we are going to try to make a compelling case to them as well. Um, they do collect the SIP data, the Census Bureau. So, you know, the SIP could implement this as well on, on some, some type of local level where, where they gather this information. But we need some federal agency, so the budget becomes expensive for us because foundations don't like to make the, the size of the grant that is necessary to collect this data. Uh, but in the scheme of the budget of the census and the Federal Reserve, it's not so expensive. That, you know, to collect the survey of consumer finance, that's in the tens of millions of dollars. To collect a city in a particular area, we start at a baseline course of about $250,000. So they, they could very well add another million dollars and really drill down on, on various cities periodically so that you're, you're, you're gathering this data infrastructure. But that, yeah, that's pretty much what, 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 what I need to say.
I don't know if we'll have last question, but I have a quick comment that I want to do a last comment for the work I hope so. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do is follow around the state in particular uh, is to increase the visibility of it. So, uh, so so just trying to talk about increasing the visibility of the data. So um, Sandy, I think you had alluded to that that eye popping figure. I think it's like two hundred and forty seven thousand dollars is the median uh, net worth of a white family versus eight dollars for an African American family and zero for a Dominican family. Those three data points alone have caused so much conversation and consternation um, in Boston, rightfully so, that we continue to just put it up in front of people and bring uh, constituents in the room, bring uh, university folks in the room, philanthropists. And last year, we published uh, the city's equity and inclusion agenda as a way to use some of this data and talk about some of the programs that the city is engaged in and some of the areas of incredible need. So the question that I have are uh, is around what are other recommendations or pathways that you have in mind for municipalities? I know you talked earlier around the baby bonds as a solution. Um, I talked a little bit about the children savings accounts work in Boston that's been very fruitful for us. But what are other kinds of um, sort of strong arm solutions that you see at the population level that can respond to the data? So I guess I'll start. Sandy may finish. But um, we, we have been talking about, Sandy mentioned the municipal job guarantee as one, one approach. And he also mentioned the constraint on, on fiscal on, on budgets at local levels. So if not even a full-scale municipal job guarantee, although that should be the goal, we can target communities that are most distressed and literally provide a job for them and not, not workfare. We're talking about a productive job that's building up the community infrastructure. And we need to rethink what, the way we define infrastructure. It's not just physical infrastructure around roads and bridges, um, although that's important and needs investment, but human infrastructure providing care work so that um, otherwise people who have to do this work would, would be free to go and do other things that they, other, that they might want to do. Um, right now, the, the, dare I say, burden of caring for a child or an elder, elderly person has gender components as well. So this could be a, 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 a more equitable policy with regards to addressing gender. Um, we, we, and it also would provide quality. So sometimes when it's left to the private sector, that the quality of care is not always first rate. So if we had it done at a municipal level, it would employ people, it would provide quality to those receiving it, but also have the additional justice effects of, of allowing people who, who are relegated by our social structures to do this work, the opportunities to pursue other things. Um, but in general, we talk about policy, Sandy mentioned earlier, municipal banking as, a, as another possibility. So the general, and we can name several others. We can talk about um, uh, ed education programs, which are now being implemented. So you can uh, tuition-free education, but we can think of other ones as well. But the overall scheme and the point of them is to set a baseline on what the private sector can do, provide, providing direct competition so that there's a baseline of resources provided for our, our communities um, for which if the private sector wants to engage in that work, they at least have to meet that baseline. <laughs> all right, let's uh, give a round of applause to all of our presenters.